Hello, I'd like to welcome you to the Grandmother's Buttons Button Museum. I'm pretty sure we are the only button museum in a bank vault in the country, maybe the world. Um, our historic bank building was built in 1905 and was in use as a bank till 1985. We bought it in 1994. We had to evict the district attorney's office who was here at the time. And a year later, we opened our store and a major feature of our store is the Button Museum. Come on in. You can see the thick, thick bank walls, that vault walls. And the vault is unusual because it has two doors which I really like. I'm a little claustrophobic and I like to know there are two ways out, but that's because there was a steel divider between the two areas of the vault. And one side had the safe, the two safes, and the other had the um, safety deposit boxes. But now it's filled with buttons. So you can see on all four walls, all the way up, and what you're seeing now, we have four cases, no, five cases of 19th century buttons, which all would have been women's buttons, um, would have been worn on those very elaborate uh, Victorian gowns, primarily from the mid 1870s on through um, the Edwardian era, ending in World War I. That is when these fancy, fancy buttons were worn on women's clothing. And three of our cases, the buttons are divided by subject matter. You can see right there, we have one with insects, a surprising theme for buttons, but one of my favorites. Uh, we just did a release of special jewelry made with insect buttons. A surprising number of flies, <laughs> even hand carved flies and pearl. Of course, horse and equestrian subjects, always popular. Roosters, who knew? There are tons of Victorian rooster buttons. One of my favorites is the little fellow up on the uh, mid left. He's a rooster playing guitar. <laughs> and then if you go on over to the corner, butterfly buttons and all kinds of different materials, enamel, carved jade, pearl, um, pressed wood. Butterfly buttons are, of course, some favorites, too, and we've done a, a limited edition release on that. Bears, why would there be a bear claw button? But bear, I, I just love that button. I come across it now and again. Dragons. Well, our best timed limited edition release was uh, our dragon release that came out the last week of, the ga of Game of Thrones. <laughs> that was perhaps our greatest marketing move of all time. And here we have uh, zoo animals, kind of a funny looking giraffe up there. <laughs> and then of course birds, um, the most popular animal on buttons were birds. Victorians loved birds of all kinds. There was a general Victorian fascination with natural history and um, hence the insect buttons, the bird buttons. It had to do with um, the Industrial Revolution and so many people leaving an agrarian lifestyle, moving to the city, and they would tend to romanticize um, nature a bit. Um, celestial buttons right there. It's another favorite. Uh, a lot of cut steel stars. And then the dogs, such sweet dog buttons. My favorite large ones, the dogs have cut steel eyes. Cut steel, um, those are little faceted bits of steel that were riveted into the buttons. We call it button bling. Okay, and if you wanna come over to our next case, these are buttons by different uh, subject matter, not so much the natural world. We have mythology here, uh, Greek, Roman, Norse, they're all there. <laughs> um, Victorian actresses, uh, there is uh, Sarah Jenny Lind, Sarah Bernhardt, and Lillian Russell, and Fanny Davenport. I guess they were, you know, the uh, celebrities of their day, and they were celebrated in buttons. Also, Victorian literature, um, there's a book, is that Paul in Virginia? 
I, I'm not sure who Paul and Virginia were, but it was a very popular book. Um, and then um, we have Asian subjects, very popular. Um, that happened um, in the mid 1800s. Europeans started traveling to Japan and the Far East, and there was just an explosion of interest for the rest of the century in Asian subjects. Of course, cherubs and cupids, kind of your quintessential Victorian image, super popular. Um, and down here, an unexpected button, John James Audubon, the naturalist, the famed painter of all the birds of America, and uh, there was a button in his in his likeness. Now it would have come out about 50 or 60 years after the Birds of America were printed. Um, and this has a lot of local interest for us because Audubon painted 80 of his Birds of America right here in St. Francisville. Um, then we have other historical figures, women. Love the painted ones. Oh, and just uh, Victorian iconic, iconic, I can't say it, the, uh, the hand, another symbol that you see throughout uh, Victorian popular art. And now here's the first case where we're dealing with the subject matter, I mean, the materials the buttons are made of, not the subject matter. Probably among the favorite in everyone's button collection are the French enamel buttons. We call this, most of these are champlevé enamel, which means a piece of brass was stamped in a pattern so that there would be wells in the brass. The powdered enamel would be um, placed in the wells. It would be fired at a very high heat. And that's what made these beautiful enamel buttons. Some had hand-painted accents as well in enamel, um, painted like with the um, enamel powder and turned out into those beautiful roses. Um, a different kind of button from a different, these were all made in France. Um, on the other side of the world in Japan, Satsuma buttons were made. Uh, Satsuma pottery was a type of uh, 19th century Japanese pottery that had a, a crackle glaze. And after Japan started trading with the West, they started making Satsuma style buttons, totally for Westerners to uh, use because, you know, kimonos didn't really need buttons, but there's some beautiful ones. These are older ones, um, the late 1800s, early 1900s, but Satsumas were made all the way up through the 1950s. And then my next to, uh, well, in the top three of buttons for me, brass and cut steel. These are stamped brass buttons in intricate patterns with the sparkling cut steel button bling. Just love cut brass and cut steel. And we feature those as often as we can in our limited edition releases. Oh, and one important Victorian button, the black glass right there. And they are not gonna show up well in the video at all, but these are the most typical Victorian button because Queen Victoria went into mourning in 1861 when her beloved husband, Prince Albert died. And the rules of mourning at the time said that widows pretty much had to wear black for the rest of their lives, or at least that's what Queen Victoria did. So her buttons were black too. And these would have been buttons that um, happen a little later in mourning, a year or two later, because they're sparkly. Your first year of mourning, your buttons had to be uh, matte, not, not uh, sparkly at all. And over here, another case of buttons by material. Um, my, and also in my top three, carved mother of pearl and ocean pearl buttons. The luster in these um, buttons, the, the, the mother of pearl means the lighter inner lining of a shell, and then the darker pearl is other parts of the shell. Um, these, these shells that were found and carved in the 19th century, not some of them aren't even available anymore. They were fished out, so these are such treasures. We have other, um, there are some French enamels that are painted with images. 
and uh, just beautiful. And oh, what's interesting about those, those are late 19th century buttons that are reproductions of late 18th century buttons, which is something that happened a good bit in the enamel buttons. Um, other materials here, um, we have horn and paper mache inlaid with abalone pearl. Love those. And here we have Victorian celluloid. Celluloid was the first plastic and it was uh, discovered in the 1860s and they were trying to make a replacement for ivory in billiard balls and that didn't work out because celluloid is flammable. <laughs> and if they were struck very hard, the, the billiard balls would uh, burst into flame, but they would make tiny, thin layers of it for buttons. Uh, there's some cameo carved pearls. Really, really pretty. And then some other uh, celluloid, they're called ivoroids, where the picture is molded into the celluloid. Now for our oldest and rarest buttons, here's our case of 18th century buttons. The buttons of the 18th century were worn pretty much only by men. Women's gowns at the time were uh, fastened with lacing and hooks and eyes, the occasional cloth covered button, but mostly these were buttons for men. And um, you can see the kind of fancy uh, 18th century coat they would have been on. You'd have a long coat and then, so you'd have the larger buttons down the coat and smaller buttons on the waistcoat and the, the knee breeches, and also on the sleeve. So lots of buttons. Um, our best 18th century button is this one, and it won't show up that well, but it's a George Washington inaugural. It's like the pinnacle of button collecting for the United States. There were about 50 different patterns of buttons that were handmade for delegates to Washington's first inauguration to wear on their coats. And we have one. <laughs> we have the eagle one. Um, I really wish I had the one that just says GW long live the president because we hadn't really figured out that President King thing yet. Um, other men's buttons, the first cut steel, um, they were made from the 1750s on. These would have been made about 1790. Uh, colonial coppers, the hand chased copper buttons, typical of what would have been worn by a, a well-to-do merchant or someone in the colonies. Um, other carved pearls, um, this is interesting. It's a set of French Revolution buttons, hand painted, reverse painted glass, and they were made in the 1790s to commemorate the French Revolution. So, and uh, just other, um, the Golden Age buttons. These were men's buttons from like the 1820s and 30s. They were gilded, um, brass gilded uh, using mercury and people sadly died to make those buttons. It's a practice that didn't last very long because the mercury, of course, was poisonous. But these are like the precursors of today's uh, gold blazer buttons. And here's a really fun button, the habitat buttons. It doesn't look like much, but what you see in there is some seaweed that's about 300 years old. <laughs> They would, um, it's part of the Enlightenment's fascination with natural history. And a gentleman would wear a set of mismatched buttons that would have seaweed and butterfly wings, uh, shells, all kinds of natural materials in their buttons. Now, if we come this way, here is one of our, um, our, we have a few articles of Victorian clothing. This is a coat from probably about 1900 and uh, the buttons are gorgeous. It's called a button called the Chinese Dragon Slayer, and it's on a rattan background. But just to show you how tiny our foremothers were, I'm going to stand next to it, even though I hate to make this comparison, but tiny, tiny women. And all of the clothes we find are about this size. It, um, I guess it's vitamins or something. Oh, now let me move this. Here are our two uh, cases of 20th century buttons. Whole different world here. Um, most of these are from the 1930s, uh, a few from the 40s, and very few from the 50s. But so much color, um, the Great Depression, made people crave color and fun and novelty. 
and also the World War II years. Um, not a lot of metal buttons. In the war years, metal was at a premium and uh, needed for, for, um, to make military equipment. And so you saw a lot of bakelite and celluloid. Uh, bakelite buttons, especially the figural ones, are really almost more valuable than many of the Victorian buttons. I don't know if they weren't made in as much quantity or what, but there's a real passion for Bakelite. Um, in fact, my Christmas present is going to be six Bakelite turtle buttons that my husband paid. I won't even tell you what for. <laughs> They're really fun. The little sets, these are called Goofies. Um, they're more from the 40s and 50s. Um, just little plastic sets uh, made by theme. And th these would have been sold at dime stores, Woolworths, that kind of thing. Lucite buttons, a later plastic. And then right there, Moonglow glass made in Western Germany in the 1950s. And we've started making a good many earrings out of uh, these buttons. They're, they're just beautiful. And over here, the last case we'll look at, it's got, um, I think they're all celluloid buttons. Just all the different kinds of celluloid made in the 19, uh, 20s, 30s, and 40s. Um, they're those, those are called glow or bubble tops that um, the light shines through them. Down here, you have buffed celluloid, uh, where it's just a particular look to those, and they're very popular. My grandmother had lots of those in her button jar, the apples. My earliest memory of playing with my mother's and grandmother's buttons, they had some of those celluloid apples in their tin. And um, come over here, I'll show you those button tins that I grew up where the whole story started. This cigar tin right here belonged to my mother, Miriam Garrett. And uh, that, that she would dump these buttons out on the bed and I would play them when, play with them when I was like four or five years old. My sisters were in high school. She made all of our clothes and she had to keep me occupied somehow. <laughs> and there she is. She was quite the beauty at LSU in those years. And then back here is my uh, paternal grandmother, Betty Gandy Garrett. And she is the grandmother of grandmother's buttons. I, she lived next to us my entire uh, childhood. And she was born in 1889 and had like 30 boxes of buttons. That little uh, baking soda tin is just one of them. And it was her buttons I was looking at in 1985 and said, Grandma, these would really make beautiful earrings. And that's how it all started. And there's my mother's mother, um, Leola Scales, and her buttons. They were kept in a Whitman sampler chocolate box, as many, many people did. And... Over here is something interesting. It's a button charm string. And this was a, mine is later, done in the 20th century, but there was a Victorian kind of hobby for young women to collect a thousand buttons, each one different on a string. It was called a charm string. And um, the, the idea was when you put your 1,000th button on the charm string, you would find your prince charming. <laughs> so. Oh, and that's a uh, World War I locket button, an army button that opened like a locket. And so that I'm sure was some soldier's mother. Button dies for stamping buttons. And then some beautiful um, 1890s jewel buttons, some sterling silver British buttons in the green case there. And um, it's still, we find uh, the buttons occasionally in those cases. And you can tell they were sold in jewelry and haberdashery shops, just like you would buy fine jewelry today. They were the sterling and enamels. They were that precious in their own time. Okay, and that's pretty much the button museum. You might wanna see up here, we have our Charles Dickens quote. There's surely something charming in seeing the smallest thing done so thoroughly. And Dickens wrote that after he toured a button factory in uh, Birmingham, England in the 1860s. And that's how we feel about it. These are the smallest things and these Victorian buttons were done with the complete thoroughness in design, material, creativity. They're really just small little works of art. There's another Victorian gown I have. 
And then another particular passion of mine is um, button folk art, <laughs> where in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, women would make pictures out of buttons. Um, they're always a little bit funky, but always joyful. <laughs> And that's our button museum. We hope you can come see it in person someday. We've uh, loved showing it to you.